Hello, welcome. It's Easter Sunday, so I thought what better topic to visit than that of the resurrection. And we're going to look at it from a historical standpoint and why we can trust it as a real world changing event. And so what really is the resurrection? And how will we, we, how will we be resurrected? And what does it mean that Jesus rose again? So let's have a look at what these things mean for us as Christians and what the scriptures say. And especially as today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus was raised bodily and historically. So if we look at the way he was resurrected first, since as Paul calls him in Corinthians, the first fruits of the resurrection. The historical bodily resurrection of Christ is central to our faith. Without it, we may as well all just pack up and go home, which is basically what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 to 15, where he says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's not true, and the dead are not raised. So a few years ago, I saw a survey about this topic, which suggested a worrying amount of self-identifying Christians in Britain don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus at all. And quoting that thing, that survey, it says, Fewer in one in three Christians in Britain believe word for word the biblical story of Jesus rising from the dead. A survey for the BBC carried out to mark Palm Sunday found that 23% of those calling themselves Christians do not believe in the resurrection of the Jesus from the dead at all. I don't know about you, but that's a worrying statistic, especially from people who are self-identifying as Christians. But the resurrection is what makes Christianity unique. And despite the misinformation that circulates on the internet, saying that Jesus is basically like a carbon copy of other dying and rising gods from Egypt and Greece, um, this is basically nonsense because all of those myths that come out saying those things don't predate Christianity. The consensus among modern scholars, which is nearly universal, is that there was no dying and rising gods that preceded Christianity. They all post-date the first century. So it's this uniqueness and reality which impacts our lives and changes us from within, because the spirit who raised him from the dead dwells in us, as Paul writes in Romans 8. Just think about that for a moment. The power that rise, rose Jesus from the dead, the incredible force of God, is the spirit that's living in us right now. We are baptised and given that spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And you think, I mean, it's, it, it's probably a lot to wrap your head around sometimes. But I mean, you think when Jesus died, that caused an earthquake across Jerusalem. So how much more power was there in actually bringing him back to life? <laughs> Evidence in Paul, in his letters, he talks about... Um, Paul talks about Jesus a lot, especially in a spiritual post-resurrection way, because that's mainly how Paul met him. But he does give us a couple of references to the historic Jesus. <clears throat> in his letter to Corinth, there was one such example which um, happened after the resurrection, which he gives, <coughs> excuse me, in um, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, where he says, Then he, Jesus, appeared to five more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And staying in that chapter, after a quick rundown of the gospel and how Jesus rose again, Paul highlights this little tidbit of information, which is basically him saying, if you don't believe me about this, you can go and ask some people who are still alive, who have actually seen Jesus raised from the dead. Because um, there's living witnesses all over the place. And it wasn't just restricted to the small group of the 12 apostles. But apart, apart from this, Paul's own testimony in life is pretty solid proof of the resurrection itself, I think. Because he was a um, very well-respected Jew, held a high position. It was um, taught by one of the best uh, Pharisees in, at the time. You know, basically living the life. And then he decided to throw it all away and endure shipwrecks, beatings, lashings, torture, stonings, hunger, homelessness, 
just for something that may or may not have happened? I don't think so. He obviously had a very life-changing encounter with a very real risen Jesus on that road to Damascus. It was not just some mere hallucination or imagination or fable he's heard. But the mystery of the resurrection is what um, is what we get a glimpse of in uh, Peter and Paul's letters, where Peter explains that Jesus went and meant went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, she says in 1 Peter 3, verses 18 and 19. Prison being the place of the dead, and where those people of previous times have gone after they died. Paul also, in his letter to Ephesians, follows up on the uh, on this same event, where he says, Jesus who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And in doing so, he made captivity itself a captive, is captive to Jesus because he holds the keys to life, to death and Hades, which is what he says in Revelations 1. And just to make a little bit of a, um, I don't know what the word is right now, a guess, I'm going to say that when Jesus went down into that shadowy place of Hades, the light of the world was probably the first bit of light, and probably the last bit of light that a shadowy place ever saw. Moving on a bit from the uh, New Testament period, you get Ignatius, who was an early church father. He was a disciple of the Apostle John, so he gives us a direct link to the apostolic period, where he gives us a nice little insight to this bit of the mystery of what happened during Jesus' death and resurrection. Where he talks about um, what happened in Matthew 27. It says, to quote Ignatius, says, For the scripture says, Many bodies of the saints have slept, that slept arose, their graves being opened. He descended, indeed, into Hades alone. He arose accompanied by a multitude. So basically the idea that when Jesus died and he went to the prison, or Hades or Sheol, whatever you want to call it, he preached to everyone who had died previously and said, Hi, I am the Christ, the one you were waiting for. And then on the day of his resurrection, when he rose, he brought all of them with him. And they came up in the tombs in Jerusalem, which you see in that little narrative in Matthew 27. So that's the whole The power of it was more than just Jesus coming back. It was he was the first fruit of the resurrection, but also it overflowed, I guess, into the people who were waiting. So the nature of the resurrection, which generally we think of it as a physical resurrection, you know, the bodily resurrection, but it's also spiritual, though it's not obviously the only type because it is obviously physical as well. Many times in scripture, when speaking of baptism, it's used to describe the symbolic act, you know, of dying and being raised with Jesus into a new creation, though know, despite we keep our old bodies. In the meantime, what you can see in Colossians 2 and 3 and Ephesians 2 and Romans 6 talk about this. This is why I believe there was such an emphasis in the early church and throughout the New Testament on baptism, and why it was something sacred and became seen as a sacrament, and why it was so highly esteemed and not an event to take lightly. Because while these verses and others make it clear that through baptism we die to our old selves and are raised anew in Christ, we must also understand that this prefigures our future resurrection when we finally put on immortality, as Paul says. Though we all eventually die physically in the body, we won't die at all because death is defeated and it no longer has a sting nor power over us. In ancient times, and probably still today as well, accepting the resurrection of Jesus of, and of, of, of our future selves as well was a major sticking point for new converts. And uh, those interested in the faith, it's probably still a bit of a stumbling block, even now, accepting that, you know, death isn't the end. We will not just go to some wishy-washy, floaty afterlife, but actually we are rejoined with our bodies, <clears throat> but better. <laughs> so resurrection was a totally new concept, really, to accept, and not just to accept, but also to expect to receive personally. 
or for it to even happen at all. Because even like you think about too, the Sadducees in the Gospels, that sect of the Judaism, which didn't even accept the resurrection. So Paul spends some time on the resurrection and explaining what it means and how it will be. Though it was a topic that was all, will always be limited by our human understanding. This is why the nature of the resurrection is always contrasted with the putting on of new clothes or building a new tent or sowing seeds. Even if you don't have a farming background, it's still easy to sort of grasp those concepts of, you know, you plant the seed in the ground, it grows up into something else. We all know how it works. So it's that sort of thing, you know, and our mortal body is the seed, we put it in the ground and we move our outer garment, this old body, and then we put on something new, we sprout into the new life. And it's replaced with something new and better. And quite rightly, as Paul says, a mystery. But it's more than just a physical thing. And I think saying the resurrection is physical and bodily, it it gets the point across, but I don't think it really does it justice. And I think better word to use is glorified. We all get we get glorified bodies. As Paul also says, like as Jesus was glorified in his body, we also receive a similar nature. Because <clears throat> our bodies, although they will be similar to our currently current physical bodies now, they're not going to be the same. And they're not going to be limited like our earthly bodies. In the same way that Jesus was changed, we too should also be transformed into the likeness of his glorious body. Which is there, because he says in Philippians verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 21. So we know that even though it's a new physical body, it's glorified, so it's an extra level of physical. It's more than what we are now in a way that we can't really comprehend, I don't think. In the same way that spiritual beings such as angels can become, you know, like physical as much as we can understand in appearance, they aren't obviously the same as we are. They don't suddenly become mortal, they're not an incarnation. I mean, that was a one-off event. So even though they look physical, they're not, they're not still as like us. They're not human. And even like when uh, Jesus ascended to the Father and later appeared to his disciples, he was no longer the same human Jesus that they once knew. So we know he was eating and drinking with them and seeming the same as before. He now appeared in their midst from behind locked doors. They were all in the room. You see John 20. The apostles locked themselves in the room because they're scared after the death of Jesus. Suddenly, poof, Jesus appears. So he's looking physical, he looks the same, they recognised him, but clearly there's something else going on there. He's, if he can just appear out of nowhere. He also travelled with people in an unrecognisable form, or managed to hide his likeness from them in some way, that they didn't recognise who he was until, until he wanted them to, which is... Um, Luke 24, when the disciples are travelling along the roads, Jesus walks with them, and then they go and have dinner. When he breaks the bread, suddenly they, their eyes are open. They go, oh, it's Jesus. And then he's like, gone. So, again, it's this whole teleportation, I guess. Travelling in the spirit, kind of like how Philip did in Acts when he met the, the eunuch. He just disappeared after that. So Christ was raised physically, initially, but then his body was different. So glorified, not human. Looking at Oregon, another early church father from around 248 in his book, Contra Celsus, he, con he captures the concept of this quite well, I think. And he says, after his resurrection, Christ existed in an intermediate state, as it were. For it was somewhere between the physicalness of the body he had before his sufferings and the appearance of a soul uncovered by such a body. It was for this reason that Jesus came and stood in the disciples' midst, even though the doors were shut. <laughs> so he has this um, idea of the soul uncovered by such a body, making him more, more beyond whatever physical limitations he once had. So what is the resurrection? It's a mystery of something which is deeply spiritual. Yet also joined in the flesh of renewed bodies. It's the hope of our future and peace over the over death and an encouragement for those who have had people who they've loved die. 
It's something we can rejoice in now through our baptism and the spiritual life in Christ that was within us, which makes us the new creation. In our baptism, we are raised new into the life of Christ. We are called a new creation. So we are living that reality now, but also not. We're still waiting for the final redemption of humanity, of the earth, of all creation, when it's renewed and we finally get to go and be in that kingdom with God, with God and Christ in our new glorified bodies to live forever with him. And that whole, the whole joining of this world and the heavenly realms, all being wrapped up into the fullness of God at the end of time. That is what, that's what we have our hope, while wow. we have to look forward to. And on this day and Easter, when Jesus rose again and walked out of that tomb on his own, he was, he changed the course of human history forever. And now open the door for us to be able to come into that reality with him and have our bodies raised up, our humanity taken into a new glorified level through our faith and renewal by his spirit. <sighs> so, amen. It was a, a topic that I like. It makes me excited. Even though I don't fully understand it all, it's the mysteries of the faith. As we like to say, in our liturgy, great is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. I think that summarises it all quite nicely. So, happy Easter. Have a good day.